Hello there to all you virtual learners. Mr. Lewis here, ready to start with Unit 3 today of AP Microeconomics. And Unit 3 is all about production and cost. So we've looked at both consumers and producers up to this point. This unit specifically takes on the role and the mindset of a producer, a firm. So we are trying to figure out not only how to assess and calculate all of our financial results, meaning revenue versus cost and what we're left over with, whether it's profit or loss, but also make further decisions based on those outcomes. So uh, we're going to see firms that lose money. We're going to see firms that, that make money. But we're also going to see sometimes firms that are losing money in the short run that might decide they're still going to operate in the long run. So there's all kinds of different scenarios that can come about. And that idea of the short run versus the long run uh, in itself is a, is a big concept that we'll cover this unit. So today we're going to start off with just the first couple sections of unit three, uh, which gets into short run costs and what we call the production function. So let's take a look. Okay, unit three, production, cost, and the perfect competition model. So here's a list of the things that we're going to look at uh, from section one to section seven in unit three. The production function and short run production costs are what we're covering today. Then in the future, later this week I should say, we're going to get into long run production costs, which look a little bit different from the short run, and I'll explain why. Different types of profit, how to maximize that profit, making decisions in the short run and the long run based on our financial results. And section 3.7 gets into the perfectly competitive market a little bit deeper. So today, 3.1, the production function. So the production function is simply the process through which firms actually generate output. So firms face constraints, right? We know that. This is scarcity. They face constraints regarding input, which means they also face constraints regarding output because you need input to get output. So you can see in this little uh, graphic down here, all of these items on our left, physical capital, labor, raw materials, technology, the knowledge and, and skills to use that technology, all of those items are what we call factors of production, right? And they all feed into the production function, which then generates output. But the thing is, all of these things cost money, right? And we're going to get to that in 3.2. What we're looking at in 3.1 is this relationship between input, output, average product, and marginal product. So if you think of output as the total product, the total number of units that we're producing given a certain number of inputs, average product is just the average of output, right? Marginal product is just the change. So for average product, it's the output per unit of input. With marginal product, it's the change in output after adding one input. So in this case, we're going from zero to four units of input, and our output goes zero, 10, 30, 60, 68. So we're adding more output as we generate, or excuse me, as we hire more laborers, or as we buy more raw materials, or whatever these inputs might be. We don't really know right now, and if you're given a chart like this, quite frankly, we don't really care, because all we need to know is what are the averages and what are the margins there. So the average output per input, we're taking the total output and dividing by total input. So at the first input, we generate 10 units of output. So 10 over 1, 10 would be our average product. At the second input, output is 30. So 30 over 2, 15 would be our average product. 60 over 3, 20. 68 over 4, 17. Now what you notice is that it goes up up and then down. We're going to talk about that. That's an important uh, relationship there. Over here with marginal product, it's just the change in output. So when we hire each new worker or whatever these inputs are, how does the output change? Well, from zero to one, it goes up by 10. So the marginal product of the first unit of input is 10. When we get the second input, it goes from 10 to 30. So the change is 20. The third input, it goes from 30 to 60, so the change is 30. With the fourth input, it goes from 60 to 68, 
So our marginal product there is only 8. Now, you'll notice that that coincides with when our average product dropped as well. Again, that's an important relationship. And, and what's essentially happening there is we're starting to experience diminishing returns. So I'll talk about diminishing returns a little bit more. But take a look at this chart and think about what diminishing returns says. We've learned in the past that diminishing returns means we're increasing but at a decreasing rate. So it's not that it's going down, right? It's not that we're losing output. It's still going up each time, 10 to 30 to 60 to 68. The problem is it goes up by 10 and then up by 20 and then up by 30, but then only up by eight. And because of that, it causes our average product to come down as well. So for whatever reason, this fourth worker did not give us as much as the previous workers did. We went up by 10, then up by 20, then up by 30, but then only up by eight. So we didn't decrease, right? They still added eight extra units for us, but it wasn't nearly as productive as their uh, colleagues who were hired before them. So that's diminishing returns. At this point, this fourth worker, we are experiencing diminishing returns for the first time because that marginal production has dipped down. And here you can see the, the total production function. So as we add more input on the x-axis, we generate more output on the y-axis. And you don't need to know this formula in any way. Don't worry about that one iota. But it's important that we understand your output is going to flatten out at some point. We are going to experience diminishing returns. It will happen to every single firm at some point. So this production starts really, really steep and very productive, but then it's going to flatten out. Even as we're adding the same inputs, that output is going to increase at a decreasing rate. And when that happens, you can see here, when the marginal product dips below the average, average is also going to decrease. This is kind of like if you think about your grade, your GPA, right? And you think about your uh, semester GPA as the marginal product per semester margin. And your cumulative GPA is the average product. It's your overall average. Well, if your semester GPA falls below your cumulative, what's going to happen to your cumulative? It is also going to decrease. Whereas over here, left of this uh, uh, dot here, this point, when the marginal product is higher than the average, even if it's decreasing, if it's higher than the average product, average is going to come up. Just like if your semester GPA is higher than your cumulative, your cumulative will increase. And then as soon as that slip happens, average product is coming down. So as soon as the margin dips below the average, the average must decrease as well. And this might change uh, right in, in the long run. This, this whole production function might change in the long run because in the long run, we can add things. We can add more technology, more human capital. We can, we can add to our workforce so over the long run, we could see changes in the production function, but one thing that's guaranteed is that we will always experience diminishing returns at some point. It is always going to happen. It doesn't matter how productive we are. We might be able to produce a greater output, but notice on this curve, it still flattens out at some point. Even though we've added all this extra technology over the course of a year, right? we can produce more, but we're still gonna experience diminishing returns. So that's the relationship between the total product. You can see it go up and then start to flatten out here. Total output. That's the relationship between that curve and the average and marginal. Average product per unit of input and then marginal product being the change in production. All right. So let's move into 3.2. In 3.2, we're looking a little bit closer. It's great to know how much we're producing, but it's better to know how much it costs us because we need to be able to do cost-benefit analyses, right? 
So 3.2 is short run production cost. And what do we mean by short run? It's not a specific time frame because it's really different for everybody. Although you can think of it in a time that's short enough where we're not able to change much about our production. So firms are very inelastic, sorry. Firms are very inelastic. Input variables are not changing because we just don't have time to change them. We don't have time to open up a new factory, for example, or something like that. So in the short run, you can only change so much about your cost structure and your input structure. So here are the three variables we're introducing on this slide. Total cost, fixed cost, and variable cost. Fixed cost is the same at all output levels. It is a fixed or what we call sunk cost. It is unchanging. You can think of this as like if we went to start a shipping company going back and forth across the ocean from California to Japan, well, we'd have to buy a cargo ship first, and that's pretty expensive. Let's say we spend $10 million on a cargo ship. Well, that's $10 million we spent before we even make a trip across the ocean. So it's fixed. It's sunk. A variable cost, on the other hand, changes with output. It varies. It's variable. So fixed and variable together equal total. So zero through three units of output. At zero units of output, the fixed cost is still there. It's $10, it's fixed. It's gonna be there at every single unit, right? So variable cost is zero, total cost is 10 because it's just fixed plus variable. At one unit of output, fixed cost is still $10, but variable is five. So whatever it costs to get that first unit produced, these variable costs, it could be labor, it could be materials, we don't really know what it is, but it costs them five bucks. So the total cost now is 15. Second unit, uh, 10 plus eight, 18. Third unit, 10 plus 18, 28. So fixed plus variable equals total. And you can see the relationship between these three curves on a graph. Fixed cost just stays the same. So we have output here on the x-axis and cost dollars here on the y-axis. So fixed cost is just a constant straight line because it is unchanging regardless of output, whereas variable cost is going to increase uh, at different uh, rates as we increase our output, right? Some are going to cost more to produce than others. We just saw that with marginal product and average product. So here's total cost. It goes up, flattens out for a little bit, goes back up. And we don't know what's causing these swoops up or down right now. I shouldn't say down. We don't know what's causing these changes in slope in the curves. We don't have enough detail. But what we do know is fixed cost will stay the same. And think about this now. If total cost is variable plus fixed, these two points together at any unit of output equal the total. So if you think about this at zero, Total cost is equal to fixed cost. Variable is zero. At the first unit of output, the variable cost has gone up by just as much as the total has gone up from its initial spot. So let's talk about averages. We can take any of these types of cost and simply divide by quantity to get the average. Average fixed cost is just fixed cost over quantity. Average variable cost is just variable cost over quantity. Average total cost is total cost over quantity. So we can go through and do all of those, right? For the output, one through four, fixed cost, 10 over one, 10 over two, 10 over three, 10 over four. <clears throat> and what you notice about AFC is that it continues to go down, right? 10, five, three and a third, 250. Why? Because we're taking the same amount and dividing by greater and greater and greater values. Variable cost, 0, 5, 8, 18, 30. We're dividing by 1, 2, 3, 4. So 5 over 1, 5. 8 over 2, 4. 18 over 3, 6. 30 over 4, 750. So this starts at 5, goes down to 4, comes back up to 6, and then 7.5. Total cost here, we take TC divided by output to get ATC. So 15 over one is 15, 18 over two is nine, 28 over three is nine and a third, and then 40 over four is 10. So this two starts high, comes down to nine, goes back up. 
So the relationship between these three is interesting, and we're going to see that on, on the next slide. But we have to learn about one other type of cost, too, and that's marginal. And we've talked about marginal changes before, right? It's simply the change in each unit. So in the output, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The total cost goes 10, 15, 18, 28, 40. Well, we can calculate marginal as just the change in total cost that occurs from producing each extra unit of output. So 10 to 15, 5. 15 to 18, 3. 18 to 28, 10. 28 to 40, 12. So it starts higher, comes down to 3, and then swoops back up, way back up, to 10 and 12. So... As we put all of these together on a graph, we can start to think about how they interact with one another. And in this case, you've got four curves, marginal cost, ATC, AVC, and AFC. And I want you to see if you can match up one, two, three, four with each of these curves. Go ahead and take a second, pause this video, and see if you can figure that out. All right, now that you've done that, let's go through the answers. Curve one is marginal cost. The reason is it starts a little bit higher, it swoops down, reaches a low point early on, and then drastically starts to come back up. And that's what we saw with marginal cost here. Five, three, and then 10, 12, right? It, it starts a little bit higher, comes down, and then because of diminishing returns, swoops back up. So that's marginal cost. ATC is curve number two. Here's the reason I know that. If one is marginal cost, I know that ATC is equal to AVC plus AFC together. These two added equal average total. So it must be the curve that's on top of the other two. It must be the highest one, right? ATC is curve number two. So how do we know between three and four? Well, look at curve four. This one is distinct compared to the others. It starts higher, comes down, and keeps coming down. So that must be AFC. Remember with average fixed cost, it starts 10 over 1, and then just 10 over 2, 10 over 3, 10 over 4. So we're taking the same number, fixed cost, and dividing by a greater output. So it goes 10, 5, 3 and a third, 250. So that must be our AFC, which means curve number 3 would be average variable cost. Starts a little higher, swoops down, and then comes way back up, right? And kind of parallels ATC toward the end. So you can go through each of these individual curves and kind of uh, analyze them your, yourself and, and um, you know, try to commit those shapes to memory because here's the thing. They don't really take on different shapes. The average total cost curve is always a U, all right, this big smiley. The average fixed cost curve is always uh, going to be downward sloping, right, consistently converging on the x-axis there. And then AVC is going to start high, come down, and swoop back up even higher. So they take on generally the same shapes. Marginal cost is always this J shape, and we can always draw it like that. Even without prices or quantities on the axes here, you can still assume it's going to take on this J shape because it's going to start higher, it's going to become efficient, and then diminishing returns cause it to fly back up. So remember... If margin is less than average, then average is going to continue to come down. But if marginal is greater than average, then the average will come back up. Check this out. When marginal cost hits the average variable cost curve here, AVC starts to come back up. When it hits the marginal, excuse me, the ATC curve, ATC starts to come back up. But when marginal cost is lower, than both of these two curves, they are consistently decreasing. It's not until the marginal cost curve passes up that curve that it starts to increase. Even here, it's above AVC at this point, right? But you can clearly see that ATC is still coming down. 
So it's not until it surpasses that curve that it starts to come back up. And that's the relationship that we need to know uh, between these different types of curves. So that's it for 3.1 and 3.2. That's it. Thanks for tuning in today, everyone. No practice to go with 3.1 and 3.2 for today. You'll have some to go with it once we cover uh, additional sections tomorrow. All right. Enjoy your day. See you later.